Streets, highways, trails, and sidewalks, among other linear passageways, are at once both powerful and peculiar structures. They consist of both the concrete stoic forms that make up their substance, as well as the transient embodied characters who traverse their spans through time and space. The silent but directing pathway becomes both a facilitator and a collector of narratives for those willing to see, listen, and perhaps participate in this journey. This beautiful tension between the permanent and the ephemeral was captured in a myriad of ways by the 57 images, images that I was privileged to curate into Street Scenes 2021. As someone who's been quite often on the other side of the jurying process, I found the process of viewing and sorting through the 371 images to be a genuine pleasure, punctuated with far too many moments of internal conflict and debate within my own mind. The sheer volume of quality work in a multitude of media could have conceivably generated three or four different shows, all of which would have been fascinating to curate and visit. My own lifelong experience with and allegiance to painting was tested challenged and broadened as I had the incredible privilege of viewing a superbly rich abundance of photographic and digital imagery. Ultimately, my 57 picks achieved a number of distinctions. In particular, they were able to transcend their medium and give the viewer an experience greater than the sum of their parts. In the end, the most important criteria was that the imagery had to be beautiful. Even if the content dealt with difficult, mundane or obscure truths. Beauty and its uncanny ability to speak truth directly to the soul was my prime guiding factor. The street has historically existed as a metaphor for a collective and individual pilgrimage through life. I trust that these thoughtful images will speak to you in a multitude of unexpected ways as you take this moment to pause and reflect upon your own journey. Okay, so uh, you wanted me to talk about uh, the show in general to some extent. And what was interesting for me in particular uh, was the sheer volume of photographic work. I found that uh, both surprising and uh, uh, wonderfully refreshing. I spend my life uh, painting and teaching painting and drawing and, and color theory. Uh, and to see such a phenomenal abundance of, of photographic imagery was just a, a wonderful, wonderful change. Um, and you'll find in the, the picks that I made for awards uh, that um, I aired against my own discipline and uh, uh, you'll find that, that photography is represented very, very well. Uh, there were uh, a number of uh, just gorgeous, gorgeous paintings in the show, uh, many of which uh, uh, made it into the, the, the curating um, we saw everything from uh, a more stylized kind of painting uh, to uh, some very traditional forms. Um, one thing that surprised me was the amount of photography uh, dealing with public murals. Uh, quite a few entrances, ent entrance into the, the, the show uh, were photographs of public murals, which was incredibly interesting as a muralist. I think what it means to me is that people are seeing murals more and more as less of uh, two-dimensional objects, two-dimensional uh, original artworks, and maybe more as monuments uh, as they might with some of the imagery we saw from the, uh, uh, the Lincoln Memorial. And that's a, that's a sea change. That's a, a massive change in thinking. Uh, to take a mural from something that is truly two-dimensional to being a, 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 a monument, a big public monument. Um, I don't know, I could be very wrong on that, but that, uh, that, that warms this, this muralist's heart very much. Well, you know, as I say in a statement, uh, the work has to transcend itself. It has to be greater than its materiality. Uh, if it is a painting, it has to be more than just this this kind of viscous colored mud that we push around with sticks. It has to uh, take me to a different place. Uh, a photograph is no different. Um, if I look at the image and I say, well, this is nice. These are nice silver halide crystals upon that surface. I've missed the point. Uh, the photograph also has to, uh, it has to be two plus two equaling five. There's certainly that, that aspect. Uh, beauty comes into great play 
um, again, whether it's a beauty that speaks to something difficult uh, or something mundane or something very, very traditionally beautiful, uh, that element has to be in place. Uh, there is a third one that is a, is a really large deciding factor for me. And it's one I didn't mention in the juror statement. Uh, you know, I tell my, my students all the time when we're in conversations about art and the definition of art and what, uh, what comprises good art. I tell them all the time, it is going to have tension built into it. There will be a tensioning factor that turns the spring, it winds the screw and, and keeps this image alive in, in some way. And these tensions can range tremendously. They can be very visceral and powerful. They can be a kind of metaphorical punch in the face sometimes, or they can be quiet and they can be very, very well balanced uh, tensions between something as formal as uh, maybe a very neutralized, desaturated warm and a very neutral, desaturated cool. And that formal tension alone is enough to charge this, this landscape or this very minimalist kind of photographic uh, uh, image. Uh, I think most of us very often are looking for tension that is both formal and conceptual. Certainly, certainly both um, uh, were things I was looking for in this show. And out of the 57 that, that I was able to pick, you're gonna find uh, both some that lean more towards the formal tensions, others lean more towards uh, a conceptual tension, but I believe in my heart that they all contain both. Hey, let's start with uh, uh, St. Augustine Intersection by Emil Petruccio. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, dynamic, very active, frenetic uh, digital image. Uh, I assume that it's somewhat digitally uh, enhanced and it just it embodies such a wonderful sense of play, uh, energy, festivity. Um, it carries multiple tensions for me. I mean, on top of uh, crystallizing down this sense of, of nightlife within an urban area at a festive time, uh, just formally speaking, this wonderful, almost spiraling, almost radial energy that this is creating uh, is wonderfully, wonderfully effective. Um, we see everything from uh, some uh, kind of a myriad of saturated and desaturated warms from these yellows, almost yellow green to yellow oranges. And they're tensioned against then uh, a gorgeous series of very, very quiet, very desaturated uh, blues, blue greens, and even a little bit of green in there. I find it just, just absolutely fascinating. It's, uh, it's one of the images I found that contains people within it, contains figures inhabiting it. But the fact that they are fairly anonymous, I, I think allows maybe for a little more open, open interpretation, maybe allows the viewer to see them as uh, almost instructional, almost as stand-ins for uh, the, the way, the manner in which the viewer can enter into this image. It's just a beautiful, beautiful digital, uh, digital photograph. The next honorable mention that I'm seeing is, this would be Bubble Boy by George Sass. And this is just, again, a, a, just a gorgeously, uh, refreshingly playful image. And we don't see a lot of that. I mean, in, in higher education, uh, a humorous, playful image oftentimes can be looked down on. It can be uh, sometimes not taken quite as seriously. And yet one would be completely, completely missing the boat here if they overlooked a, a playful image like this uh, uh, due to that fact. It's, it's gorgeous. Uh, the various tonalities, the, the atmospheric perspective uh, going back towards uh, either a, a city, uh, looks like it could be either 
the, the, the skyline of a city, or those could be hills in the background. We don't know. There's a real ambiguity to place. This could be, my gosh, this could be places in, uh, in California. This could be Gibraltar. This could be Morocco. This could be areas in Spain. And that sense of a kind of uh, ethnogeographic ambiguity is, is part, of the, part of the magic with this one. I find myself, myself uh, uh, working in a kind of almost elliptical uh, trajectory as my eye works its way from uh, the fellow creating the bubbles up to the right through that sun, down uh, through these, these kind of beautifully, beautifully backlit bubbles, which become so material, so concrete in that atmosphere. And then through the faces of the children as they're playing through the, uh, through the mist that they're creating. Uh, seeing the various reactions becomes a, a kind of a, a game of people watching uh, from the, the, the small children who are enthralled and the, the adults who are, uh, some of them look as almost as if they're becoming, a, they're becoming children again, especially this, this one woman. Um, you know, I think there might be some, oh, some very, very uh, academic, uh, somewhat, uh, uh, forgive me, hard-nosed classic photographers who might take some issue with the burning that's happening with the very tip of the pole in the upper zone. But I like to think that a photograph can be as malleable and as object-like as, as a photograph. And so that is of no, no trouble to me at all. Um, it just feels like, uh, it feels like the kind of manipulation uh, we need to push the eye back down towards the center of a center of interest. It's a, just a gorgeous image and, and very surprising. It's, it's very different than the sorts of, um, the sorts of imagery I'm, I'm used to looking at critically. I'm moving on to Fifth Avenue by Nancy Keene Fischel. And I have got a very graphic sensibility in my own painting. Um, I have a great love of illustration and the graphic arts. And seeing this image, it, it certainly speaks to uh, much of that uh, much of that DNA in my own, my own aesthetic makeup. Um, it's an image that's, that is both wonderfully balanced uh, from left to right. It's balanced chromatically with these, uh, you have yellows, you have the yellow oranges, and then you have these beautiful, beautiful blues uh, showing up in the pants of this, this repeated figure. It's funny, as I look at this, it's very difficult for me as a, as a child of the 80s, not to start associating it with, with certain uh, uh, British uh, late 80s uh, techno music. There's, there's a little bit of that, that kind of playfulness, that little bit of that, uh, that rhythm and repetitive nature happening in here. I think that combined with the graphic nature uh, and the urban setting feels very, very much like... Uh, Oh, almost like the sound of London in 1989. I love the fact in particular that she has taken and neutralized so much of the periphery and the street, the buildings behind, and then hypersaturated uh, what's actually alive and moving and kinetic uh, as it passes through the street. The sense of time, the sense of time passing uh, is uh, very much alive in this image. I'm moving my way to 7th Avenue by Christopher Fowler. And this is the last of the honorable mentions. Uh, and they're all more than mentions. These are, these are beautiful, beautiful images in their own right and, and deserving of, of this award. Um, it's funny, you know, Christopher, he's taking something that's extremely static the building, something that is not meant to move. If it moves, there's a problem. He's taking something that is uh, uh, just superbly still. And by placing it at this kind of vantage point, by creating this composition in which the eye is moving for most of us, 
in the manner in which many of us in the West learn to read, which is from left to right, he's creating this lower left to upper right uh, movement. And the series of buildings becomes very, very decontextualized. We see them for their abstract qualities. Uh, they almost become this, this, this airplane wing of sorts um, in this upwards from left to right ascension. The way that he's bringing in various, uh, various textures from the, the windows to the brickwork to who knows what this is in the upper middle, they all create these wonderful rhythms uh, that, uh, that complement each other. And I have to say, being, being a diehard colorist, here is another image in which the, the nuanced balance of warm and cool are existing uh, beautifully, just beautifully. Uh, also, I want to I want to give him credit. You know, I think a lesser photographer may have taken that upper left field of atmosphere, and they could have left it fairly blank, fairly austere. He gave us just enough information in that zone to activate it and keep it rewarding for the viewer's eye. So there we go. Those are the four honorable mentions, four beautiful, beautiful images. Um, and my apologies to my, my, my painting brethren like myself, they are all photographs. So I'm gonna move over to the three grand prize winners here. And I'm going to begin with Stay the Course by Morgan Dwyer. And I realize I'm probably overusing the word beautiful. It's, it's very difficult for me not to, as I work my way through these, these finalists here. Uh, but here is yet again, another sublimely beautiful kind of image. In it, we see metaphor. Uh, in it, we see uh, uh, something very concrete, which is the, the, the ground, the street itself, and this deeply, deeply ephemeral atmosphere that is both inviting and maybe for some a little terrifying. And this is the metaphor. Uh, this, is, this is the road of life. Uh, and we can only see so far, and we cannot see around this corner. Uh, do we stay? Do we go? It creates for us a, a kind of decision-making on the part of the viewer. Um, There's a beautiful, beautiful balance between the slight, slight cools of this, this paved roadway, the neutralized greens, yellow greens, along the side of the road. And then these two, well, there are more actually, the, these punctuated moments of yellow orange standing up vertically towards us and then uh, receding in space as we work our way backwards. It's an image that reminds me a bit of the, uh, the incredible Japanese photographer, uh, Hiroshi Sujimoto, uh, who does uh, quite a bit of work dealing with, with motion and time and, and atmosphere. I'm moving on to Into the Shadows by Richard Kenneth Begbie. And uh, while I forget the exact uh, nature of the medium here, whether or not this was digitally manipulated, um, this is another photograph which has grab my attention, uh, grab my, my sense of beauty and, uh, and activated my own, my own appreciation of this aesthetic. Uh, there's a kind of hypersaturation of some of the colors. We see this in the various blues in the sky, everything from a cobalt blue to a thalo blue. Uh, as we work our way down through these neutral warms, we catch these wonderfully, wonderfully hypersaturated uh, oranges and red oranges down below. But it, if we stop there, we miss violets and blue violets and, and even a little bit of neutralized red orange off to the, to the left. Um, this is another image in which uh, there is this, this wonderful tension between the static, being the buildings, being the roadways, uh, these windows potentially, if that is indeed what I'm seeing. I mean, there's wonderful mystery here, and mystery itself creates tension. Um, 
but there's this this sense of movement, the sense of patterned rhythmic movement through this this very static landscape, and and uh, Richard moves us through here. I think very smartly. I, I very much enjoy this this very uh, geometric uh, rectilinear shape that is being formed in the upper upper margin, which also helps to to create essentially a new skyline, an imagined skyline, while also moving us from left to right. So this is Rebecca Duran's beautiful, really, really stunning formalist photograph called Moving Towards Change. For me, this embodies the theme of the show just beautifully, maybe better than anything I've seen in the entire, uh, uh, the entire range uh, of, uh, of candidates. In here, we see everything from the, the, the very immovable, uh, the concrete, quite literally and, and, and figuratively speaking, nature of the street, uh, the street that will be there for another 100 years potentially. And yet we have this incredible series of marks uh, almost like an abstract expressionist painter from the late 60s might make, uh, that have happened recently, that are the evidence of human coming and going, the evidence of human passing. Uh, they're also the evidence of time. We look at these aqueous marks over to the, on, on the right-hand margin in particular, and we see that some kind of process has taken place. We don't know what it was exactly. It looks, you know, it was probably something very messy, it probably wasn't intentional, and yet look at what happened. It created something outside the control of man's hand, and we have these stunningly gorgeous, gorgeous um, curvilinear forms, these aqueous forms that tension beautifully against these more uh, geometric rectilinear forms of both the, the frame of the photograph itself as well as these, uh, these very intentional, very cold uh, uh, street lines, both the yellow and the white. We see a crosswalk uh, moving us diagonally and tensioning us nicely in a perpendicular manner against this implied line of these orange dividers. Uh, like virtually every image I've talked about already, she also has this really wonderful tension here chromatically between these hot, saturated, analogous warms, orange, red, orange, yellow, yellow, orange, as they are uh, moving through the field against a gray street that is, at least through my screen, a slightly, slightly cool gray. And if we look carefully, for those eagle-eyed viewers, you're going to see in the lower third uh, marks upon the street, which are of a of a almost a cerulean blue. That's no accident. Uh, Rebecca had a wonderful, wonderful eye as she uh, saw this scene, composed the shot, and then cropped uh, cropped so so masterfully. Again, it's a shot that that is as much about sameness and stillness as it is change in passage and transience. Um, it's quiet, there are no people whatsoever. And yet the evidence of their coming and going is so uh, wonderfully present and so wonderfully mysterious. It's, it's truly one of my absolute favorite images from this show. Um, it's, it was interesting to look at the, uh, look at the work as a whole on my screen and see the images uh, all about, you know, about this size, very small, and see it as, as a body of work. Because one of the things that came across to me immediately was uh, the love of color. Immediately. The moment I saw this show, I realized this is a community. This is a group of people who are just absolutely positively in love with color. Um, and not just color, but very, very saturated color. 
Um, uh, the kind of colors we, we oftentimes associate with, with warm locations. I don't know if it's the time of year and this is what we're hoping for maybe, and this is why we're showing that kind of work. Um, but I was, I was just wonderfully overwhelmed with a, a, almost a, just a tsunami of, of beautifully, beautifully saturated work. Uh, for myself, you know, when I'm, when I'm thinking about color, when I'm thinking about uh, the use of color, as I'm, as I'm composing my own work, as I'm looking at the work of others critically, balance is something that I'm always looking for. It's something that's always present in my mind. Um, are there balances between, very often, the simplest one is, are there balances between warm and cool? And uh, if so, what is the saturation? Uh, we find sometimes that oversaturated work can make up, it can be an attempt to compensate when uh, it's, it's maybe speaking too loudly. Um, very often a more, a more desaturated color might work better. Uh, it might speak better to the calm, to the, to the sense of, of atmosphere. And just for example, uh, you know, in, talking with, in talking with young students about color, it's funny how many people are afraid of it. They're, they're, they're genuinely afraid of color and they'll, they'll tiptoe in uh, with maybe one singular monochromatic spot color. And very often people will ask, well, what's, what's wrong with the piece? I, I love this color. I love blue and I've made this drawing blue. Um, why? Why am I not in love with it? Well, very often we take a look at it and uh, while the values might be correct, while the blue is beautiful, the saturation is wrong. Or, and very often, maybe more often than not, it has nothing oppositional to tension the blue. There are no warms, there are no yellows, no blues, no, I mean, yellows, oranges, or reds to help us uh, attention that, uh, that image at all. And this is what I see uh, uh, very often. Um, I think with some of the some of the candidates that we saw for this show out of the 371, uh, you know, there were certainly some images that I found just fascinating, absolutely fascinating, but maybe the color uh, threw me a bit. If it was a quieter image and the colors were oversaturated and speaking much more loudly than, than I felt like they should for the subject matter, I think it was more easy to to uh, to uh, observe them, appreciate them, and then and then pass by. During an online uh, exhibition is uh, of particular interest today in 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 the climate of uh, COVID. Um, in this digital age, also when so much of our lives revolve around this machine this screen that we peer into for so many, so many minutes, hours, days, weeks of our lives, um, it has become part of our life. It's become a medium in and of itself. It's a venue in and of itself. While, you know, some might argue that uh, the objectness of a painting, the objectness of a photograph even, yes, they do have that is lost or diminished in an online uh, environment, uh, there's some wonderful things to be gained. Um, accessibility not being the least of which, um, where one might enter into an uh, in-person show in a specific location, and you might have 300, 400 people show up uh, to see it. When your work is online, there is, just an exponential increase in the potential for who can actually see this. There will be people in your realm who are going to look at it, people in your state, people across the country, over on the West Coast are going to see this show. There is a guy in Morocco who is going to look at this show. He is going to see your work, I guarantee you. And there's something just wonderfully magical and exciting about that. That possibility. And I think if, if the digital world is here to stay, oh, and it is, um, 
we have to embrace uh, so many of these phenomenal benefits. Um, there's also another thing. There's a kind of, for better or for worse, there's a kind of equalizing that occurs in a digital realm that's different than in a, uh, a physical gallery space. Uh, one of the things you notice immediately is that we are not looking at objects uh, with any hierarchy to size, right? We're not. We're not looking at objects that are placed at the good end of the gallery versus maybe the, the slightly lesser end of the gallery. There's an equalizing that goes on. We also miss frames. Frames are completely absent in, in most uh, online shows. And one cannot discount the, the impact of the frame and the way that it changes the way we view the piece. Uh, so no, I'm, I'm thrilled to be uh, uh, jurying a digital show. This is my very first digital one to be jurying. And uh, uh, I look forward to uh, viewing it online with the rest of the world.